everyone. Welcome to this Stat Dose podcast on heart murmurs. So we're going to cover basic cardiac anatomy, pathology, how to assess for a heart murmur, the clinical relevance of finding a murmur, and then we'll summarise. So let's just run through some cardiac anatomy, everyone's favourite. So venous blood enters the right atrium from the superior vena cava and the inferior vena cava. It then flows through the tricuspid valve into the right ventricle. And then during systole, it's pumped up through the pulmonary valve where it enters the, cir- uh, the pulmonary circulation and where it gets oxygenated crucially. After that, it enters the left atrium going through the mitral valve or otherwise known as the bicuspid valve uh, into the left ventricle and then up through the aortic valve into the systemic circulation where it perfuses the organs. The way I like to remember which way the valves are is that there's an L in mitral uh, so the N in mitral corresponds to left and there's an R in tricuspid and the R corresponds to right. That's how I like to remember Otherwise, the, only, the key thing to remember about the heart sounds and certainly the heart, the heart murmurs is that the love dove sounds that are created and that you hear are created by valves uh, snapping shut suddenly. The first heart sound is created by the mitra and the tricuspid valves clothing, um, and the second heart sound is created by the uh, aortic and the pulmonary valves closing. So during systole, the mitra and the tricuspid valves are closed, and the aortic and the pulmonary valves are open. And during diastole, the reverse is true. So the aortic and the pulmonary valves are closed and the mitral and tricuspid are open. Now, in my in the corner of my eye, I can see my two colleagues doing some very unusual movements. What on earth are you talking about there, Liz? You're doing some lub-dub dancing. Oh, well, I was just thinking about where the valves are when they're doing that. But there's a little <laughs> mnemonic um, that I know that helps me remember. All prostitutes take money. Oh, all potatoes so, taste monkey or magnificent? No, all prostitutes take money. That's useful for when we're, when we're examining patients and we're looking at surface anatomy. Obviously, A is aortic, P is pulmonary, T is tricuspid, and uh, M is mitral. So when we're when we're examining these patients, there's a, a simple way to work out whether we're listening to the first heart sound or the second heart sound. So the first heart sound corresponds to a palpable pulse, which is quite helpful when we go on to talk about murmurs. And there are some examination uh, techniques that we can use to manipulate the sounds. Right-sided murmurs are louder on inspiration. When you inspire, you drop your intrathoracic pressure, which increases your blood flow through the tricuspid and pulmonary valves. So if you ask your patient to take a deep breath in while you're listening, you'll be able to hear it more loudly while they're breathing in. The opposite happens in expiration, so left-sided murmurs are louder, mitral aortic on expiration. I'll like to use the letters again in that, so there's an E and L, in E and L, an E in left, <laughs> Sorry. which corresponds to expiration, and there's an I in right, which corresponds to inspiration. What about positions, if we manoeuvre a patient in a different way? So if you set a patient up, it brings your heart, comes closer to your sternum, so your aortic valve will move forward towards the sternum and make it louder so you'll be able to hear an aortic murmur much more easily if you sit a patient forward and lean them forward. Leaning to the left side brings the apex of the heart closer to the chest wall which makes mitral murmurs louder. So if you're unsure about whether it's a mitral or aortic murmur then doing those postural techniques can help you differentiate. You can combine the two as well, but you can combine the breathing that we talked about mm-hmm. uh, and, the, and the manipulating of positions. So if you sit a patient yeah. up, get them to hold out an expiration. It's normally the phrase mm-hmm. I use. And that's going to make an aortic murmur louder. If you get them to lean on the left side and hold out an expiration, that's going to make a mitral murmur louder. So moving on to talk about uh, some key pathology then. When we're thinking about murmurs, noise really is created by by three things, either blood flow through a stenose valve, which is a narrowed valve, or blood flow through a regurgitant, sometimes called an incompetent valve, which essentially is very floppy, um, or sometimes through septal wall defects, which we won't really touch on. But essentially, when you're when you're examining a patient and when you when you think you've detected a, a murmur, there's a few things you need to do. So I use a four-step approach. Uh, the first thing you need to do is note whether it's uh, after the first heart sound or after the second heart sound by palpating the pulse. So is it a systolic murmur or is it a diastolic murmur? Based on your surface anatomy, so the old prostitutes take money. You need to work out where which valve you think is the most likely to be affected. Now, using that uh, basic information we we use at the start you can work out whether the, the likely valve affected is going to be open or closed at the time of that murmur. And then you can tie that information together to give you a likely diagnosis. So if we just run through an example to hopefully make that make sense to you guys, 
So let's say, for example, that you, you hear a murmur. It continues after the first heart sound, but stops at the second heart sound. You hear it loudest at the fifth intercostal space in the mid-clavicular line. You therefore think that's a mitral valve pathology based on the surface anatomy. And you know that the mitral valve should be closed after the first heart sound, i.e. during systole. So the noise is related to the mitral valve after the first heart sound. Therefore, that valve must be regurgitated because it should be closed. So therefore, the most likely diagnosis is a mitral regurg. Hopefully that makes everything as clear as mud. There's some key pathology then that we need to sort of just touch on just uh, to give you guys a few clues about the most likely valve pathologies that you're going to hear. So aortic stenosis gives you classically uh, an ejection systolic murmur with a crescendo, decrescendo murmur, which typically radiates to the carotids. It's loudest if you're going to sit the patient forward and if you're going to hold out an expiration because it's an aortic murmur. What about mitral regurge murmur? It's probably the most common valve pathology. Yeah, so mitral regurge is a pensystomic rumbling murmur that radiates to the axilla um, and it's loudest if you lean the patient over onto their left. What about aortic regurge, Helen? You get an early diastolic decrescendo murmur and it's loudest if the patient sits forward and holds on expiration, so breathing out. And then mitral stenosis is a mid-diastolic rumbling murmur and that's loudest again if you lean the patient onto their left side and get them to expire. What's the clinical relevance of finding a murmur? Well, detecting a murmur is all well and good, but what is the point of it? Um, ultimately, you need to get an echo to determine, is it valve pathology? Is there a structural cause behind it? And are there any complications, including reduction in the ejection fraction or increased pressures? To put the murmur into context for the patient in front of you, you've got to be thinking, do you need an echo on the same day? Is it okay to get an urgent two-week outpatient echo, or can it just be done routinely in about six weeks' time? So what criteria would make it a same-day echo, Matt? So many options there. So concerning sort of red flag things are chest pain in the context of a murmur. So you've got to think actually there, have you had a large sort of ischemic event that's caused a valvular prolapse or, or a regurgitant valve? Um, collapsing is always concerning in the context of a murmur, particularly aortic stenosis. That's a big red flag if you've got a patient who's, who's having collapses, particularly on exertion, and you need to be worried that you want a same-day echo then. Uh, or if you've got someone who's in acute pulmonary edema or is really short of breath, in the context of a new murmur, then that's going to be, again, a big red flag. Have they gone into flash primary edema because of normally mitral regurge? So these patients would often have deranged observations and bloods as well. Yeah, so so, exactly. So as, be- as Liz was saying, it's the patient in front of you. So that's probably going to be a mm. sick patient who's hopefully in hospital. Sometimes these patients do sort of drag themselves into a GP surgery, but mm-hmm. hopefully it's either called an ambulance or have made their own way to hospital. Um, or if they're in a GP setting, then that's something you're going to want to probably escalate in relatively quickly to get into hospital. So a two-week would be someone that's having symptoms but not life-threatening. Like yeah, like so there might be someone who's immediately life-threatening. Who's reported some heart failure symptoms, maybe they've got slightly puffy the legs. And they've got a bit of a murmur, but actually they're, they're well, they're, their oxygen levels are okay, their exercise tolerance is fine. Mm-hmm. And that's something you might want to get an echo for in two weeks. And the six-week one would be just to rule out anything yeah, that's sinister, I mean. just that's, just in case, a tick the box. That's going to be something, yeah, you, you've, you found a murmur in a well patient, you almost weren't expecting to find it. A lot of times mm-hmm. it's an incidental murmur, that's probably going to be yes. your right. yeah. routine. In general practice, it might be that you're examining the patient's chest for some other reason mm. um, and you happen to find this murmur. Okay, so just to summarise, um, remembering the basics and working through the murmur slowly to identify the likely cause. Put the murmur into context of the patient is always really important. Don't try and be clever. If the patient has a murmur, they're going to need an echo at some point. 